यार तुम हमेशा अपना बुजिया इतना जल्दी कैसे खत्म करते हो तुम कभी शेयर क्यों नहीं करती हो गया तो था दिल्ली में मार्च 2012 सीरियसली 2012 मार्च अच्छा ले लो वैसे मानना पड़ेगा आज मैंने तुम्हें अमेरिका में दिल्ली वाली फील दे दी है ना परसों से प्यार जताने का तरीका हल्दीराम Session, Empire Land: How Imperialism Has Shaped Modern Britain. Santam Sangera in conversation with Yasmin Khan. A session that explores the reality and legacy of the British Empire. Satnam's latest book, Empire Land: How Imperialism Has Shaped Modern Britain, is a brilliant commentary on the painful history large parts of the world share. His narrative focuses on the importance of accepting Britain's imperial past in order to understand its present and future. In conversation with academic and writer Yasmin Khan, Sangam Sangera explores why the existence of the British Empire is often forgotten in modern Britain and underscores the importance of confronting a deeply troubled past. Can I please invite both of you on stage? It's all that time I had to spend pouring whiskies for my uncles <laughs> in uh, Wolverhampton. Comes naturally. So I think a lot of people here will already be familiar with Empire Land. I'm guessing that a lot of people may have read it or seen it. But this is Empire Land, Satnam Sangera's amazing tour de force, which has just had this incredible life, hasn't it? It feels like a campaign almost. Um, yeah, yeah. No, and I saw something amazing. where your publisher had actually said, you know, it's more than a book. It is a kind of campaign um, because you've had the TV documentaries. They've gone alongside it on Channel 4. Had... Um, Schools are getting copies of the book. So, I mean, is that how it feels to you? Do you feel like you're, you're campaigning? With yeah, no, it does feel uh, as much of a campaign as a book. Um, but I didn't write it like that. You know, I wrote it just for myself because I knew very little about uh, British imperialism. Um, and it was accidentally timely. You can't plan these things, unfortunately, because uh, I didn't know Black Lives Matter was going to happen, which has created a massive global interest in colonialism. But, yeah, I mean, it, it's being taught already and... You know, it's good having success when you're older because you, you appreciate it. And uh, I realise that that's not a normal thing. I mean, people don't write a book and it's not immediately being taught. And uh, I've learned to enjoy these things. Well, I think it's a credit to you because it's, it's, it's about the way that it's written, because it's about your journey, but also a very compelling, detailed, nuanced history of the British Empire. So we get, we get both. We get your, your own um, journey through finding out about this and all the and all the kind of humorous aspects to that, but also um, that really kind of solid history that people seem to be crying out for. But yeah, I, I, th I think I've, what I've realised is that a lot of history books, present company accepted, are written for historians. And I think there's a whole world of people who wouldn't normally pick up a history book. Or when they do, they're confused. And I, I'm, still, I, I'm writing a sequel, and... I'm picking up history books, and I regularly don't understand what they're talking about. They assume a lot of knowledge. So I guess it's useful to, to write an adult history book where you explain things. Yeah, I did, I did want to ask you about that, actually, because it does feel like... I mean, you're assiduous in um, crediting all the historians who've written sort of tiny, narrow monographs about every single aspect of Africa and Asia and, and Southeast Asia. Um, but it does feel like there's a disjuncture between popular understanding of empire with some exceptions also i mean obviously at this 
at Jaipur, we see some of those people who managed to make, communicate those histories. But it feels like there's a distinction between popular understanding and then like what's been going on in, in universities and among his Yeah, students. I think ac academics, again, present company accepted, aren't particularly good at uh, explaining what they do to non-academics. And maybe they're not motivated to, because that's not the way their success is measured. Um, also, I think there's a disconnect between older people and younger people when it comes to this subject in particular. I feel like young people are fascinated with colonialism, and it's the history they're most interested in, and there's not actually that much material available for them. So they have to look elsewhere. So there's hugely popular Instagram accounts about colonialism and brown history, and probably not a co corresponding number of, of books. So let's get into your journey into this, because I mean, one thing that really stood out to me in the book is when you say, I read Edward Said's Orientalism. It's an, it was published in 1978. And then you were like, it's a, it was like a, a, you know, a gut punch. And I've suddenly, if you, you have the kind of zeal of a, of a convert almost, that you've discovered all this history of Orientalism and of empire that's been out there. Is that, I mean, yeah, it no, feels it, like you've been on a journey. Yeah, to, definitely. To I mean, this, it's quite shocking that I was 42 before. I bet you lots of people in the room would probably know who Edward Said is. Um, but I didn't. I didn't know that. And actually, you know, one of the books I studied at school for A-level was Jane Austen's Mansfield Park. And I hated it because I, I thought it was boring. And it said nothing about my life. And then I realized that at the same time, Edward Said was writing about Mansfield Park and pointing out that there was this undercurrent discussion about slavery, which would have made it really interesting to us. But none of our teachers pointed out Edward Said. And you know, I went through my entire education and studied my first brown writer in my final term of university. No brown teachers at all, and no his historical figures of color, apart from Martin Luther King for half a week and Gandhi for half a week. That was it. Yeah. I mean, all the other brown people were murdered slaves, or conquered people in India, that's it. Yeah, and I think, I mean, you can feel that people, that resonates with so many people who are educated in the British education system over the last decades. Um, but it seems like for you, going to Amritsar and Punjab to do the documentary that you did about the Amritsar massacre and about Dalian Wallabog, I mean, that's one of the places where you start in the book. Was that a, was that a revelatory Yeah, I, ba I basically realised that the average Indian on the street knew a lot about British Empire, and um, I knew embarrassingly little. And one of the uh, things about Empire, one of the legacies, is that we tell ourselves in Britain that we have the best education system in the world. And I was told that all the time, and I went to a school which had some of the best exam results in Britain. I went to a university which was named the best university in the world. So you walk around thinking, God, I'm educated. And then you get to the age of 40 and you go to Amritsar, Amritsar and you realize you know much less than the average man on the street. So I just began filling, filling the gaps in my own education, really. And it became a book by accident, really. There's a lovely quote in it where you say, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm decolonizing myself. <laughs> And it's yeah, I feel like that. I feel like that's a long process as well. And um, yeah, I think as a nation, we're doing it in a very dysfunctional way, but we're beginning to do it. And, and then within that also, there's your own Sikhism and coming from a Sikh family and the fact that there's a very particular history that the Sikhs have in the British imperial story, which on the one hand is, a, is one of sort of martial loyalism and um, being part of, of the armies, of suppressing 1857. And on the other hand, it's one of great resistance and rebellion. And you reflect on that in the book. But do you want yeah, to say I mean, a bit that, more about that? That was endlessly surprising, realising that, you know, the entire self-image of the Sikhs was shaped largely by the British. Because, we you know, we, we see ourselves as a martial race. Not that you, that you can tell that from my, my physique. Um, and... Uh, that was created by the British. I didn't have any idea. I didn't know the, Brit uh, the Sikhs took the side of the British at the mutiny. I didn't know there were Sikh soldiers amongst those shooting at Johnny Wallabog. I mean, that's quite a, a difficult thing to face up to. Um, but also, I didn't know there was massive resistance. The, the, was it the Gagar movement? Gadar movement? Yeah, the Gadar movement. Yeah, and I didn't know about that either. So it's been an incredible education. Everything about my life can be explained by British Empire. The reason I'm here. And yet, I knew nothing about it, or very little, beyond that scene in Gandhi. You know? 
But it, 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 that's what comes across in the book, is that journey of discovery. And, do, I mean, how has that changed? I mean, has that changed everything for you, then, how you think about Britishness as well? I mean, has that changed? Yeah, it has, pretty much, yeah. yeah. It's changed a lot of what I think about Britain and my role in it. It reflects the way I feel about museums, multiculturalism, the Windrush scandal, um, Stephen Lawrence, uh, our post-war history, the NHS, which was, I realised, in the middle of the pandemic, is staffed by 44% BAME people. You know, that's a legacy of empire. So it's everywhere in this country. It's in our language, our politics, Brexit, our the imperial nostalgia of Jacob Rees-Mogg and Boris Johnson. Um, and, yeah, it's absolutely everywhere, isn't it? Once you start seeing it, you can't talk about anything else. <laughs> it's a bit like um, that scene in Goodness Gracious Me where they say everything's Indian. Yeah, Indian. <laughs> you start to say everything's imperial. Everything's imperial because you. But yeah. it's true. I mean, we we play this game in my family where you, you know you only have to go to a stately home and it doesn't take five minutes before you start to see something that's yeah. That's and the imperial. jubilee. And, the jubilee. You realise yeah. how Indian the royal family are because uh, you know <laughs> they they live together in a big house. You know <laughs> they're really into arranged yeah. marriages. Apparently, the Queen really likes Tupperware boxes. <laughs> which uh, my mum's really into as well. Um, but as we know, there's a real imperial connection to the royal family. I mean, Queen Victoria speaking Hindi. Was Hindi or, or learning Urdu? Yes, yeah, she was learning Urdu. And she had a servant yeah. who was Indian. Um, she was really into being Empress of India. Interestingly, she was Empress of India and not Empress of mm -hmm. the Empire. But I find that very interesting. But yes, sorry, I've gone off subject. No, but, but that's what comes across in the book, is how you are unpicking how far empire is present in places that we might not have naturally thought it to be present. So it's, it's there, it's in botanic gardens, it's there in museums, it's Actually, in, you mentioned yeah. something interesting, like botanic gardens, which yeah. I more or less forgot to mention. Okay. Um, <laughs> but I'm writing my sequel, it gives me an excuse to go into yeah. it. Yeah. But oh my God, botanic gardens, do people realise... I did, I've been to Kew Gardens loads of times and just see it as a nice place to see some nice plants, take my mother along, see the roses. And uh, that's where Britain spread all these plants and helped make you know, Sri Lanka into a tea colony and discovered a, a major cure for you know, malaria. And I didn't realise it was so colonial. And it's, it's, it's moving away from that idea of colonialism just as something violent, I suppose, as well, which seems to dominate some of the popular kind of conceptions of empire because what you're showing is the motivations for empire are much more nuanced than that it's, it's, it's yeah exploration. It's, but you were talking about it we were talking about this earlier about the question that always comes up is was empire good or bad and i address this repeatedly in the book and I've, it's a question i get asked about most and you get asked about it a lot by your students and other people and it's not a question i think you can really give a straight answer to because as a if you're interested in history, you want to understand it. You don't want to measure it. It's not like a, a bottle of water you're giving a review to on the Boots website or something, you know? Um, but that is the way the British talk about empire. And it's really dysfunctional. And I normally get... I'm actually not doing events this year, um, apart from this one, because William Dalrymple blackmailed me into doing it. Um, but I don't do them, because whenever I found I came out and did them, I always get a couple of white men actually sometimes Indians, in their 70s, who shout at me, who say, you're a disgrace, you know, why are you doing down British history? You should be more grateful for what this country has given you. And it's like, that's not the way history works, man. You gotta, which, I'm just trying to understand it. Mm -hmm. Everyone should be trying to understand it. And I feel the same about people who just want to say empire was nothing but evil. <laughs> empire, like all history, is complex. You need nuance, but you don't need to try to come to the weird balance and this whole balance sheet is, is stupid. It is very strange how this whole balance sheet seems to dominate ideas of imperial history in a way that it wouldn't if you were doing sort of medieval Avignon or something. <laughs> you know, it, yeah. nobody wants to, to, in other historical subjects, make you weigh up, was it good or bad? But there's yeah, always I mean the, this question. I, I, in general, you shouldn't compare, compare empire to Nazism, but yeah. I would say, but would you say, was the Holocaust good or bad? Were the Nazis good or bad? Was Mussolini good or bad? You wouldn't say that. But literally some exam boards in this country are setting that as a question in 2022, you know? It's really deeply dysfunctional. And then you also wrote about how if you don't celebrate empire, then you can also be coded as anti-British, that there's a sort of sense that you're not patriotic 
if you don't celebrate them, or, or if you if you start to pick apart empire or even talk about it, yeah, critique if you, it, if you, you do down British, British history, it. and it's our government have been doing that. Uh, this government and certain ministers have been going around saying we're going to remove funding from museums who who engage trustees who talk about negative aspects of our British history, and it's like. That is literally what's happening in Russia, <laughs> you know, and it's so terrible, but it seems to be actual government policy, and it, it, they, they basically can't end soon enough, in my opinion. But you seem to have been... Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to stop the applause, but, I, I, I mean, you seem to have st um, managed to steer a very careful course through these culture wars. Um, and I'm quite intrigued by how you've managed to do that. And I think it's because you're committed to, to really telling the nuanced detail of the history and weighing it up and showing how complicated it is rather than um, emphasising one side or the other. Well, I'm glad you say that. I do, I do feel like I have. But lots, many, many thousands of people would disagree because lots of people think I've been too mean about empire. And there's loads of people on the left who think I've been too lenient on empire. Um, but I'm basically a centrist dad. You know, I'm one of the many, many centrist people in this country who like to be in the middle. Um, I think it helps that I work at the Times. So I think I can get away with saying things that other people will be shut down for, for, for being woke. Mm. But I think it, that sort of helps. But I also read in it that there's a, there's a kind of commitment there to a, to a form of patriotism almost. That like actually, it's because you care about this country that you want to understand this history. And you say, if we don't confront the reality of what happened in the British Empire, we'll never be able to work out who we are or what we want to be. And that's something that really, I think, I mean, we can see with Brexit, also with uh, questions around Scottish devolution and what's going happening in Ireland. I mean, there's a lot of questions at the moment in Britain about who we want to be, what British nationalism is, how we kind of cohere and pull this country together. Yeah. And I felt like that seemed to be running through the book, that there's, a, yeah, there's that question is, is an important one for you. Hopefully you can read the book and think, I, I'm really proud of being British. I really am. It's just that a certain type of Britishness has been adopted by this government. Mm. And, I mean, I'm very much of the Britishness that was being celebrated at the 2012 Olympics. That was a form of Britishness, wasn't it? And now we've got another kind of Britishness. But each type of Britishness tries to make out that the other doesn't exist. And that's the problem. But I'm glad you can read the book and realise I don't hate Britain. And actually, yeah. it's because I love this country and I'm grateful for everything that I want to make it better, that I want us to be less dysfunctional about our history. So it's sort of by dealing with these amnesia and these gaps and the things that have been forgotten and not talked about that we can actually kind of somehow bring people together. Is that, is that what, yeah. what you think? Yeah, I think, yeah. I think this history ultimately could bring us together because if you look at our imperial history, what we are basically is we're... British Asian as a nation. India was so important. It was the key aspect of imperialism. And if you think about that, basically we've been British Asian as a country for hundreds of years. And there's lots of British Asians here. That's a positive thing. It's something that links us all together. And there are terrible things that happen. But even in a family history, there's terrible things that happen in your family history. It doesn't mean you hate your mother or father, you know, just shit happens, right? Um, we just need to understand it. Um, and that, kind of link between imperial history and migration histories and the arrival of British Asians and, and British black people and people from across the empire seems to, that's another unique aspect, I think, of what you're doing because you're making that connection. I mean, there's that famous phrase, um, uh, we're here because you were there, which is there as one of the chapter headings, which comes from um, a former director of the Institute of Race Relations. But that, that kind of link between empire and then um, the migration yeah, and story a, is was, a really... You know, I think that's a positive story. Strand. I think most British people think it's positive. The problem is there's also a deeply negative aspect of it, which is racism. You know, I argue in the book that we have a particular brand of racism in this country which goes straight back to empire. You can see the attitudes just continuing. You've got to remember things like basic things, like there was a colour bar in Wolverhampton until the mid-'80s in some pubs. You know, um, The royal household did not employ brown or foreign people and, uh, until, I think, until 1966. Things like that mm. reveal that we do... White, um, British Empire was white supremacist and we've inherited those attitudes as well as the multiculturalism. 
You can't separate the two things, I think. But I wonder, um, you know, if this is a if 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 you feel that you're actually just sometimes are you winning people over or are you preaching to the converted? You know, are yeah, there because there's a lot of people yeah. here who might agree with you and we mm. and and we. Who, I, who, I think about that a lot actually, because uh, and actually I think it's a combination. Sometimes I'm just talking to people who, who agree with me. I suspect this audience <laughs> probably agree with me, but then I do events in very white parts of the country where you have real hostility. And actually, you know what? It's not easy writing about Empire in the Times of London. <laughs> I get a lot of shit and a lot of abuse and a lot of racism, which William Darrenpole has very kindly spoken out about, because he's been writing sim similar stuff to, to me for decades and, he, and says he's never once had a letter of the kind I get every week telling me to F off, you know? And uh, I think that reveals something about how much in denial we are about this history and the racism of it. And they're still coming, those letters? You're still, still getting that? Yeah, they're yeah. quite persistent. Um, they tend to increase when you, when you appear on TV mm. or when you're in the newspaper, yeah. And always letters for some reason. Why yeah. Not, why not emails? <laughs> um, I think you can't find my email online. Ah, that would be That's right. why. Yeah, yeah. So they write, and yeah. if you send a letter to me at the Times, um, it comes to, eventually gets to me. Yeah. So you can send some, some different yes. sorts of letters. Yeah, send me some <laughs> crap some, in the post. <laughs> not literally. No. Um. <laughs> um but there are, I mean, because however sort of carefully we try and tread through this, there are some episodes in the book that are really dismal, shocking stain on the British record. And I mean, Tasmanian history, for instance. Yeah, in and, there. and shockingly, it was a genocide. And it, it, it's it, unbelievable. And the way and you, you write you about knew, it. You knew about it. I that, did right? know about it, but I thought the way that you wrote about it made it real. For instance, calling it Tasmania, not Van Diemen's Land. I mean, it just it kind of created an immediacy, and also because you you use the first names of people rather than their surnames. You know, there's something about it that made it very real. That genocide, which wiped out the the Tasmanian population, and there's these stories of people walking around with bits of earlobes and and kind of body parts that they've used yeah, as as. So um, as I think a, a, a woman had her partner curled in front of her. The man was then decapitated, and she was made to wear his head. Uh, as a necklace, you know. But I think it's really important to bring that stuff alive because, you know what, in this country now, we've got Tasmanian genocide denial. I don't want to mention the historian's mm -hmm, name. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, he's not a historian, an academic figure who's been arguing that the Tasmanian genocide didn't happen. And that's the level of the lack of knowledge in this country, that someone can say that. I mean, I didn't read a single book, even the more right-wing ones, including, I think, Paxman and Niall Ferguson, none of them denied the Tasmanian genocide. And yet, it's happening in our mainstream press. So I think that's so shocking. And it, it seems to me, you know, some of the more shocking episodes in the book, like the Tasmanian genocide, um, Mau Mau, that happened in Kenya in 1950s, where torture was, was demonstrably used against the local population and has been and, upheld and, in courts and very recent and very recent yeah. and also w was being um, hidden from uh, memory through the disposal of archives that weren't weren't donated to the national archives as they should have been yeah. at that time and we were having anti-black racism on our streets in britain at exactly the same time exactly the same time yeah. but it's, it's, some of those episodes aren't um south asian and we're here at Jaipur Literature Festival in India. And I sometimes, and I don't want to do myself out of a job because I'm a historian of South Asia mm -hmm. as well, but it sometimes feels to me like the, the South Asian story has dominated our imperial history because we've there's such an affection and uh, attachment to India and so many people have had a contact with India and been to India on holiday and um, we have that mutual shared history that sometimes we forget these other episodes that have happened in other Mm. Other places. Yeah, I, I really wanted to connect the West Indian uh, Caribbean history to the Eastern because I find that the historians separate themselves, don't they? Really, mm. and actually, it was separate. The two issues were separated in Britain when the people came over, when the planters made a load of money in the Caribbean, and when the people from the East India Company made a load of money. You know, they concealed their wealth. Some of them did. I think there's a weird paradox where. People who'd made their money from slavery were more, more open about it than East India because India was seen like the modern-day equivalent of being a Russian oligarch, whereas 
the upper classes could understand plantation slavery because it involved land. You know, it, they could get it. Yeah. So it's a weird contradiction where they conceal the Indian history more than they conceal the slavery history. But it seems to me we almost need um, a kind of connected history of empire for it to make sense. Because if we just look at one bit, if yeah. we just look at slavery, we just look at the British in India, it doesn't quite join up. But yeah. you have to see these things in circulation. I mean, you have to imagine that people... Totally. Are and, that, and it gets even more dysfunctional. Because, I mean, I, I went back to my old school and asked them what they were learning. And some of the kids had, came away with the idea that slavery was something that just happened in America, that we weren't really involved in it. And so I think that the levels of ignorance are profound. So we've got to start at a very basic point. Yeah, I think somewhere in the book you say something as if, you know, Britain carries on as if slavery was nothing to, to do with us, as if it wasn't actually happening here, because it was geographically located yeah. oh, it reminds in me of Caribbean. That, that Eric Williams quote where he says, the way the British talk about slavery, it's almost as if they only went into it so they could have the satisfaction of abolishing it. You know, yeah. that's the yeah. way we talk about slavery, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. So we just yeah. congratulate ourselves. We don't yeah. remember the three million slaves we transported across the Atlantic and how we led the industry for, I think, more than a century, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and I was talking earlier to Chris Manjapra about um, months, what happened during emancipation, so-called, when there were all these reparations being paid across the empire to um, former, former slaves slaveholders yeah. as well which is you know a huge story so there's there's so many kind of different connections and, and yeah stories and there. that i mean paying 20 million pounds to the slave owners unbelievable we already stopped paying you off in 2015 but then i don't know if you guys remember this but the uk treasury tweeted saying hooray uh we've paid this off aren't we yeah. great <laughs> mm. it's like oh no we're, we're congratulating ourselves for Paying money to very rich people for enslaving black people hundreds of years ago. Well done. You know, it's really dysfunctional. And let, I mean, while we're on that, let's talk about statues a bit. Because I, you're a bit, in the, in the book, you sort of say, I'm not really, you know, there, we, there's been so much controversy, hasn't there, about I mean, Colston's been thrown in the water in Bristol and pulled down. And then the Rhodes in Oxford has been a point of contention for, for years now um the the commemoration there of, of, of roads but but i get the impression you, you say at some point you're not it bothers you walking past clive in yeah, london uh, clive i wouldn't mind if someone dragged clive down <laughs> <laughs> it could be rishi sunak who looks at it every day yeah. it's right outside yeah. his office <laughs> um but equally i mean basically the statue thing happened just as i was finishing the book and my editor was like you should write a chapter on statues and I started to, and I was like, you know what? I don't care, ultimately. There's just street furniture. We haven't noticed it until recently. Compared to racism, politics, multiculturalism, our wealth, it's not that much of a legacy. I mean, my preferred solution is uh, once a year, everyone gets a box of tomatoes, and you can pelt the statue you hate the most uh, <laughs> with uh, tomatoes. And then you're not accused of deleting history. And people learn about these historical, historical figures. I think they do something similar in Spain, don't they? Yeah. Um, uh, obviously, we'd have to keep in mind food waste. That'd be terrible. But this, I mean, Gary Young says that we should tear down all statues because they're all crap. I've got some sympathy for that as well. Um, but ultimately, I don't think they're interesting. But they've created debates which are quite interesting. But are those debates really getting to the... Question, because I, you know, there's in a way they're becoming a proxy for something else. They're becoming a proxy for British politics, for yeah. for kind of left, right, cultural war. Cultural war. Yeah, I'm trying to avoid using the phrase cultural war, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ultimately we it have is. to we have to say it. Don't we? That it's become a proxy for a different kind of discussion that doesn't seem to really be about. No, it's not about I mean, about it's, empire. It's not about history or anything. I mean, my favorite thing is the sillier things that happened around that debate. So, I remember when when everyone was uh, attacking these statues, but also people were protecting them. So the far right started appearing at, to guard statues around Britain, and a bunch of far right people turned up to guard the statue of George Eliot in Nuneaton, mm -hmm. the novelist, yeah. uh, who was anti-slavery and uh, massively spoke out about anti-Semitism. And they had no idea she was, but they were guarding it anyway. And, uh, <laughs> and then we had uh, the culture secretary, Oliver Dowden, 
mm. who's no longer, no longer culture secretary, he said he was going to tie himself to the statue of Nelson in Trafalgar Square to stop woke people tearing it down. <laughs> and no one's threatened the statue of Nelson. I mean, no one's yeah. serious. Also, I'd like to see him, you know. <laughs> I'd like to see him tie himself to that statue, you know. Uh, but that's, it's just so silly. But that was the level of the conversation, wasn't it? Yeah, it, I mean, it feels like it can potentially, maybe it gets some people to read up about Clive's story and learn about the, the, his kind of rapacious uh, extraction of wealth from India, but actually it doesn't seem like it drives much kind of serious engagement. No, it's, but I, I mean, I, for my TV thing, I did go and meet the a descendant of Clive and uh, met him at the statue of Clive in Shrewsbury, and I expected him to be very defensive, but he was like, God, I hate this statue. I wish they'd tear it down. Um, <laughs> yeah. The guy was a complete yeah. arsehole. And, uh, that not, made... not the guy you met. The, no. The, the, he... the, the... <laughs> oh, he... <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> For legal reasons. <laughs> Just being clear. He was lovely. He looked like Santa Claus, <laughs> yeah. literally. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, lo I love when things like that happen, when, when you get complexity, rather than the basic yeah. kind of... Think, yeah. And and perhaps one of the most complex things that you've really do seem to get very involved in there's this uh, idea of restitution in museums and how those things. I know you went up to Aberdeen and met the museum director there, where they've done quite a lot of work of taking human remains back from that museum. Yeah, to, and, yeah. And, uh, the level of uh, conversation about reparations in this country are very. I guess we're talking about museums here mm, rather than slavery mm. reparations. It's very basic. And, uh, you know, even if the British Museum returned all of the contested items that are contested, it would still have 99.9999% of its collection. And, you know, only 1% of its collection is on display. And actually, I, I met George Osborne recently, who's the new chair of the British Museum, and he said, oh, I read your book, Sanam, and I saw that figure about 99% of the collection being in storage. And he said, it's not really fair, because, you know, some of those items are really small. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, the coin or diamond's really small. <laughs> what do you mean? And some of those items are human remains. That's a, I mean, that I didn't really appreciate until I saw some of them. I mean, no one even knows they're there, you know, and yeah. our museums have them in, in storage. Yeah, that, uh, and that idea that it's not really the value in a material sense. It's not that some of them might be very valuable, like the Kohinoor, but it's actually the, the, the value that they have to the people. I think at one point you say something about it's like um, Napoleon taking Stonehenge and putting it in Lille or something. You know? yeah. and, you, and you feel that it's, this is, these are things that just have very deep symbolic yeah, These are meaning. things that, which explain who the, p these people are. So if you're a member of the Australian Aboriginal people, you know, and you see the shield that the first Aborigine that Captain Cook met was holding, you want, that means something, because he wiped a load of those people out. They're, now there's so few of them, that shield means a lot to them. And yet, it's in a corner of a cupboard in the British Museum, probably not even displayed sometimes, you know. And I feel like the Stuff that made me angry in relation to the Sikhs was the, you know, the stuff taken out of Ranjit Singh's, uh, you know, treasury, the coin or diamond. Yeah, I don't think that matters as much as the fact that Ranjit Singh had the galgi of Guru Gobind Singh, the feather that the Guru wore in his turban. I think, God, to see that, and there were some relics of the Prophet Muhammad, apparently, lost because it, the white guys didn't really care about that. It, wasn't, it didn't look valuable, and they lost it. That stuff is painful, isn't it? That, you, that these people have lost them. And it's sometimes, even if they stay here and they're on display in British museums, it's the wording and the captions and the way that they're then presented and, and yeah, depicted. Yeah, and there's and so I much language, that, isn't there? Yeah. They, it often says, this, this shield or this boomerang was presented to John yes. Cook. And it's like, <laughs> don't think it was presented. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. He might have shot the owner. Yeah. You know, stuff like that. Yeah. And it was probably stolen. Yeah. Um, but that's why, I mean, Black Panther, the film, is great. Have you seen it? Ninth most viewed film of all time. Yeah. And there's a scene where one of the black uh, heroes goes into the British Museum and says, I'm going to take that. And the curator goes, no, you can't. That's ours. You can't steal it. And it's like, well, you stole it from us. <laughs> I'm taking it. And I feel that's the attitude amongst young people. I mean, the way young people, I think, feel about museums is 
how our generation felt about zoos. Because I remember mm. going to zoos as a kid and thinking, let them go, man. <laughs> why, why are you sticking a lion in, in Dudley Castle? You know, it's really cold. <laughs> um, but I think young people feel the same about museums. Yeah. I mean, you seem really optimistic about younger people and you're doing quite a lot of work with, with younger people. I mean, do you feel that that generational divide is, is very stark in It's Britain? quite profound. Um, but ultimately, I'm afraid to say, we, we, we're going to die off, aren't we? So <laughs> um, Britain is getting more and more diverse and it's getting more and more interested in this history. I mean, there was a survey done recently which found that 78% of British people, around 78 or 75, thought it was a good idea to teach kids about slavery and colonialism at school. You would never guess that, the way the government talk mm. about it. You'd think like, people were furious. You know, They didn't want to have this woke history in their face. But I think mm. most people in Britain are interested, and they don't mind. Um, and young people especially don't mind. I think they're going to school and saying, why are you not, why are you not telling me about Indian history? Why are you telling me about the Tudors for four years? You know? <laughs> and Tolland Man. Remember Tolland Man? A lot of that. Yeah, um, yeah so people want, people want a different history. Yeah, but the appetite is there and the demand, the demand seems to be there. But yet, our government seems to be very determined to, to, to sort of not let that happen. Yeah, and, I mean, it's, and a, it's I, and a reaction. Why is that? It's a reaction to Black Lives Matter and it's a, it's a deliberate political strategy because they think it's a way of holding on to voters who voted Conservative but are actually probably Labour voters, so they're you know, economically left-wing but socially right-wing. They, they think the flag is cool, they love the Queen, they hate people who are doing down in British history. But I think they're imposing their view of what these people are like, because these are people from my town, of Wolverhampton. They're not like that. <laughs> and I think it's a deliberate culture war which is not going to work. And I, I think we're seeing it fall apart right now before our eyes. That's a very, yeah, that's a very encouraging kind of it's vi encouraging, vision. Except we've got two, at least two more years of this <laughs> insanity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's interesting you said that about Wolverhampton because it ultimately a lot of this does come back to Wolverhampton as well. Everything comes Everything back to Wolverhampton. Everything comes back to Wolverhampton, doesn't <laughs> Everything. it? It does, yeah. it does seem like that for you is a touchstone of where this, this, you know, they, there's this massive global empire story, but there's also Wolverhampton. Yeah, the heart of it. Yeah, it? I guess, I mean, I'm from, I, I've written a memoir, novel, and a history book, and all of them have gone on about Wolverhampton. And I, I realise there's no appetite in the world for a, the Wolverhampton trilogy. Uh, <laughs> but I've written it anyway. And uh, I think Wolverhampton's really interesting because it was one of the first places in Britain to experience mass immigration. And so I think, in a way, it went through a load of stuff that the rest of the country went through much later. So I actually think it's a useful place to talk about. And it, you've got Enoch Powell right there and all that immigration. So it is a, it is a kind of... Yeah, it's a it kind of like, touchstone. It's like a, yeah, it's, it's like a like touchstone. A, mi a microcosm of the whole nation. Um, we've got time for a couple more questions and then yeah. before I hand it over to, to everybody here. But I, I suppose lots of people will be wondering what you're going to do next now after... after. What, today? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, yeah, that too. I'm going to have Nando's. <laughs> um, oh god I should have something Indian tonight shouldn't I in, in honour of yeah, this festival so. um, I'm writing a sequel uh, about, about how British, British Empire shaped the planet that won't be controversial at all um, so but it's not uh, it's not the Nar Ferguson balance sheet thing it's about looking at things now explaining how those things occurred because of empire so for example certain countries will farm just, say, tea, tea plantations, penal colonies. Some of our tax uh, laws go back to empire, um, uh, the way our NGOs and charities work, um, green colonialism. So each of these areas is a, a kind of a, a nuclear bomb of con controversy. So I'm going to go into hiding as soon as it comes out. <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm writing a kid's book, but I'm not meant to tell you. Just keep it quiet. Um, the kids' version of this. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I resisted doing it because I didn't want to water down the violence. Um, but apparently, kids can take it now. 
So <laughs> they're just going to have a load of violence in their books. I think kids think it's quite cool. Well, obviously not cool, but they like to hear about violence. Oh, are there going to be illustrations in this book? Yes, I think all kids' books are illustrated. I don't have kids, so I don't know what's normal. But yes, there's going to be illustrations. Yeah. Sounds, sounds I won't be doing them. <laughs> yes, thank God. That sounds, sounds absolutely fantastic. And I think, as you can hear, I think um, there'll, there'll be a lot of, uh, a lot, a lot yeah, of appetite so it's really, for that. So. It's amazing Go to hear, man, because I just think... I find it amazing that kids are going to grow up and have this knowledge that I didn't have until I was in my 40s. Because it's changed the way I see everything. I think it would have changed my life if I'd known this stuff, you know, in my teens. And I feel excited for kids, but also I feel really jealous that, you know, we didn't know about it. We were endlessly hearing about... Um, the Tudors, and uh, which, which are interesting. I love the Tudors. I mean, my favorite book is Wolf Hall. But do you need to study it for four years? You know, mm. when actually British Empire is the biggest thing we ever did as a country, biggest empire in human history. But yet we study the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, but not the British Empire. It's crazy. Um. Well, Sutton, I think there's going to be so many questions here from the audience, and I don't want to stand in the way of being of people being able to ask those questions, so... Um, yes. I'm very happy to answer them, but I am going to say I'm not going to answer any question about whether Empire was good or bad. Because <laughs> um, I think people ask that question a lot. And what they want from me is they want me to change my answer. You know, mm -hmm. I write, I address it in the book, and I think sometimes when people ask the same question again and again, what they want is not an answer, they want obedience. You know, mm -hmm. they want their view repeated back to them, and I'm not going to give that. But anyway, ask anything okay. else. It's all right, it's not compulsory. Okay. Well, I thought it might be being here. But anyway, um, I'm glad you mentioned immigration towards the end of the conversation because that's really quite a, I don't know if it is in your book and in any substantial way. Um, because that really is about a denial of links uh, with the colonies. And uh, you were talking about brutality, and I just wanted to uh, point your uh, attention to a really um, brutal episode of British immigration where uh, Asian women were subjected to virginity testing because on the basis of be our, pa our patriarchal values were being turned against us as a community that if you were coming here for a genuine arranged marriage, you would be a virgin and therefore you were subjected to virginity testing. And that's in my lifetime. And I sort of still shudder to think about, it's not even something that goes back before I was born. And it's so- the 70s, I do actually talk about it in the book. Oh, you do? Yeah, okay, and, great. Um, so sorry yeah, about no, that. I, I, I found out about it. I think you've, you, you've written about this as well, I think. I've I, talked I, to you about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's shocking, and it happened in the 70s, and that's when my mum was coming to Britain, and the idea that might have happened to her. Um, but those are colonial attitudes, because British people thought Indian women, they don't have sex, so therefore that's an easy way of working out whether they're genuine or not. But, yeah, unbelievable, and not that long ago. 79. Yeah, 79. Yes. Hi, um, so I'm an American writer, and I moved here just a year and a half ago. And so in the U.S., you know, we focused all this conversation around colonialism and, and slavery only on America. We actually don't learn anything about anybody else. Um, but one of the things in the US is the Black Lives Matter movement, which you've mentioned, which started in 2012, but took global stage in 2020. I'm curious how that movement has influenced your decolonization journey, and then maybe broadly the decolonization journey of Britain. Thank you, very good question. And I've been thinking a lot about the American connection to British Empire, um, because I've been writing it. Uh, an introduction to my American edition. And I think there's a view in America that they rejected all things to do with British Empire when they had the American War of Independence, you know. But they forget America was created by British Empire. Those slaves didn't end up there spontaneously. The British were involved in getting them there, were among the powers that got them there. Uh, the British used the cotton way past abolition to fund industries. I think there's a deep connection between America and British Empire. And actually, in the late 19th century, there was this incredible movement to union, to kind of um, bring these people like H.G. Uh, Wells and Andrew Carnegie were obsessed with 
tying Britain and America together. They wanted Britain and America to become this Anglo-Saxon super race. And so I think there's deep connections. And I've forgotten what your question was. <laughs> oh, yeah, Black Lives Matter. I mean, Black Lives Matter happened towards the end of my book when I was just finishing it. Um, it was amazing when I... I mean, I was just about to finish it, and I, there was a, a leading item on the, nine, on the 10 o'clock news about the ways in which colonialism has shaped racism in America. And I was like, oh, my God. It's like it's so odd when you're writing something really seemingly obscure when your friends don't understand what you're doing. And suddenly it's the biggest story in the world. So I think it probably shaped more the reaction to my book. Um, that's probably why so many people read it, rather than what my, I wrote about, because I've written it already. And I wrote it mainly for myself. Thank you for your question. Got there eventually. <laughs> Hi, Sam. Um First, I want to acknowledge what you said about the complexities of empire. I, I, I'm, I'm ethnically Indian from Malaysia. I would not exist if not for colonialism because um, I'm Tamil, Telugu, Malay, big people who would not have come together in India in the context, context of the caste system of geography and all that, but because of indentured slavery, here, here I am. Um, I think, and that relates to my next question in terms of, I think, in the discourse surrounding colonialism in Britain, I, I found my country's experience isn't really reflected in indentured slavery, um, the fact that Indians were brought over to different parts of the world. And Indians, for example, in Malaysia, 7% of the population, lower social mobility, still in rubber uh, plantations. Um, in fact, I think a few years ago, I'm not sure if it's, this is in your book or you're aware that a bunch of Indians tried to sue the queen and said, you brought us there and then you left us there and you don't even let us come here. I've, I've been thinking basically, what do you think is the role of modern Britain in sort of addressing this? As a Commonwealth citizen here in the UK, I've checked what are my reparations? What are the privileges I get here? I get to vote in this country. I get to work for the civil service here. There's a special visa that exists for white Commonwealth countries, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, where you get to work here for two years under 30s. Doesn't apply to everybody else. So I think linked to the previous question about immigration laws as well, Britain went overseas, stayed there, now won't let people in as well. So complex question, but basically, what do you think is the role of Britain to right now in terms of policy and all that to address the very real inequalities and disparities that exist because of what was Good done? Good question. And, you know, I think what you're pointing out is that our immigration legislation is racist. And it has been. And there's a report came out recently. Well, actually, it came out only after the government tried to repress it, which found that all our post-war legislation was racist. And it goes back to the whole... What idea of white men's colonies and brown colonies. But Malay, Malaysia is really interesting because I'm writing about it in my new book and writing about indentured labor, right? People don't talk about that very much, you know, and hundreds of millions of people were moved around the world so that British Empire could produce, produce certain goods in certain areas. And I don't think that's very well understood in the Indian diaspora. I don't think people understand. I didn't understand, like, someone like V.S. Nepal has ended up in Trinidad because of indentured labor. I, I mean, talk about lack of education, but I didn't understand that until about a year ago. And, and the extent of out migration of, of white British people to, to Canada and, yeah. and America and Australia. I mean, there was no net migration to this country until the 1990s, which I always find astonishing because we always think of it as an island that people arrived into. But and actually the, the story the... is one of people from Britain populating the earth. And also the, the dominant narrative in our lifetime is that Britain is being invaded by brown mm. people. So you know, that's another way in which we colonize the way we think about this country. But on top of everything else you, you mentioned, like Malaysia, people don't think about Malaysia, do they? Mm -hmm. I think there's such a focus on India. I think there's a focus on India even during empire. Um, and there's a focus perhaps on slavery in the Caribbean. But we forget about Burma, Malay. Middle all East. The, yeah, Middle East. Yeah. And, yeah. But yes. Hopefully, I'll answer some of your questions in my new book. Um, and, hello, I, I'm John Elliott. I'm a journalist. I was in Delhi for many years. Um, a visitor from Delhi um, a few days ago asked me whether I thought that Britain was ready for a South, a South Asian prime minister. <laughs> I said yes. He seemed surprised. From your vantage point, what do you think? Good question. Um, I think Britain was really ready for Rishi Sunak, prime minister, about four months ago. <laughs> <laughs> but he's got no experience. Sorry? He's got no experience. 
Uh, no, no, the, he, there was a scandal. You might have missed it if you don't live in this country. Uh, we discovered, he turns out, he's one of the richest people in Britain. Um, yes, and wasn't paying taxes or something. And uh, now he's one of the least popular people in Britain. But there was a brief time when I did think we were going to have a, a, a South Asian Prime Minister. I, do, I did feel that he was being approached because of who he was and his abilities and not his skin colour, which is something I don't think would happen in my lifetime. People generally don't mention his Indianness. Do you feel that? Or am I, am I imagining yeah, that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so in that way, I think we've, we've, we've almost becoming post-racial. But I think that's just Asians. I think there's deep anti-black racism in this country. Deep. And it's really prevalent to the media. It's the way the media write about black communities and present black politicians. And you've already got to reflect on the fact that Diane Abbott is the most trolled politician in this country. You know, because she's black, basically, and a woman. Well, thank you. Good question. Um, <coughs> hello, can you hear me? Yeah, oh, hi, Satnam. Hello. Uh, so, um, read your book, love it. Um, seen your show on Channel 4, that's also brilliant. We've exchanged some messages on Twitter, actually. So, uh, and I know you think Twitter is a cesspool of uh, activity. <laughs> I know that. But the, the, the main thing I wanted to say was that, you know, I've been a bit of an ardent uh, uh, fanboy of Indian history in the UK. And therefore, colonialism, imperialism, all has a say in that. For me as a person, today in this room, I have, there's you, there's Shashi Tharoor, and there's William Dalrymple, all three of you in the room at the same time. It's one of those Bollywood, three Bollywood star kind of a moment. Right? <laughs> so, you know, between the three of you, I, I'd really like to ask you a slightly provocative question, if that's okay. Um, nuance, you know, you're all nuanced differently, but what's your perspective on how, and nuance is fine, it's great. How do you think your nuance is different from them both? Um, you know what? I didn't realize Sashi was here, so I'm now really intimidated. <laughs> <laughs> that was the idea. To, uh, that was the idea. And delete a few things I said. And William's here. Oh my God. God. Uh, well, I think William. God, I talked about you, William. I didn't realize you're here. Um, I think I'm, I've I've read both books and I admire them a lot. And uh, William is basically responsible for most of my Indian history. And I think he's probably responsible for most of Britain, British people's sense of history. I mean, he's the dominant writer of Indian history. And I think he's done great campaigning work in recent years. He's been vocal about the culture war. And uh, Sashi's done amazing work. You know, your book's great, but also, like, you've gone viral so many times. So you've done great, provocative work, which has, I think, woken up white British people to Indian history, you know. And the, I think people have realized just how nostalgic they are when they come across his videos and because he's so articulate. Um, but I don't think I could have written my book without those two books, uh, those two authors in my life. Thank you. Uh, hi, Satnam Tulsi here. Um, I have a question because this term gets thrown around quite a bit. Um, how do you define decolonization? And you mentioned it a little bit in the beginning of the talk as well. Um, what does it mean to you? Yeah, I realize decolonization means look very different things to different people. And I probably go for a centrist vision of it. You know, I think you can decolonize curriculums without deleting the canon. I think you can teach Shakespeare, Jane Austen, and you can talk about the imperial themes in both those authors' works. And you can talk about empire at the same time. But also I'm aware that for some people that's a very weak idea of decolonization. Some people think that muse all museums should be shut down. You know, we should have entirely revolutionized the British canon, literary canon. I probably don't subscribe to that. I'm probably a bit more conservative. Where do you stand on it? I was born, I think I was born the same year as you. And, we, and we've had very similar educational experiences as well. So I, I, I agree with you in that. And I mean, that's in terms of, for instance, thinking about the Second World War, I mean, this, we've seen how the First and Second World War can be taught completely differently without actually changing anything that anybody was already being taught. It's just, it's just adding nuance and yeah, depth and complexity by talking about the contribution millions of, of millions of, people. of, yeah. of, of so, so I'm... I'm I'm of the same persuasion, but I, I, think, I think there is a generational difference as well. Yeah, there is. And oh, I also think, 
you know, people who have more radical views of decolonization. I really respect them. Someone like Kinder Andrews. It's, I, I think it's a really important argument. We need to hear what they say. But I think ultimately, if you're going around saying we need to close every museum, we need to burn the national curriculum to the ground, I think you're not going to get anywhere. And you need to take people with you. And uh, it's a negotiation. Yeah. So I guess I'm quite Blairite without the Iraq war um, <laughs> when it comes to uh, decolonization. Uh, Satnam, yes, I mean, hi. Anshul here. Uh, how do you see the post-colonial like, colonial conversation in UK compared to other ex-colonial powers, essentially, say, France, etc., all the other, in comparison? And if there was any, if you would think there has been any ex-colonial power which would have been, which could potentially be a model or example of how supposedly truth and reconciliation or whatever should be done in the, in the UK? Excellent question. Um, there was a survey done recently of Europeans about how nostalgic they were for their empires. And Britain wasn't the most nostalgic. We were the second most nostalgic country in Europe. The most nostalgic were the Dutch. The Dutch were very nostalgic for their empire. Um, there's nostal empire nostalgia in France. There's definitely empire nostalgia in Russia at the moment. You know, And uh, I think... Macron, when he came along, actually said some really progressive things. I mean, he was involved in a report about the French museums. He was talking about returning stuff. Uh, Germany recently gave a billion dollars to Namibia. Is that right? I think and apologized. Um, I don't think any of the former colonial powers are particularly brilliant, but the best example is Germany with its history with World War II, the way in which it confronts it on a daily basis, and manages to be proud of, of itself without, you know, without basically still acknowledging terrible things were done. So there's a great book called Learning from the Germans by Susan Nyman, and she compares Germany to America and its history of slavery and, and just points out how amazing Germany is compared to America. So I think that's the example, although Germany has its own problematic colonial history, which it probably hasn't confronted in the same way. Thank you. Um. Hi. One last question. Hi. Um, I'm Radhika. I was just wondering, I heard some people mention post-colonial, post-imperial. Do you think we have passed the age of imperialism, or do you think there are still empires today? And if yes, which ones? Absolutely there are empires. And I really recommend the book and The New Age of Empire by Kahinda Andrews. And he argues that America basically continued uh, the the traditions of British Empire in a different form. And he argues the United Nations, a lot of the World Bank, they're basically imperial. And uh, something I've been looking into recently for my new book is the way in which NGOs repeat you know, imperial tropes in the way they deal with Africa. How I didn't, I didn't come across the idea that you know, when it comes to environmental um, campaigning, we're imposing a Western view of the environment onto Africa, you know. Why aren't they allowed to develop their countryside in the way we developed our countryside? And stuff like that blows my mind. And I think right, um, right, uh, readers like, sorry, writers like Kahinda, Kahinda Andrews are, are so important, but I think you, you definitely can spot the traditions in not only American empire, but in Russian empire and in the new superpowers. I think we have to draw it to close there, although I know that there will be other questions in the audience, and many people will already have Empire Land or have read it, but if you haven't, um, it will be there in the bookshop. Thank you very much, Satnam Sangera. Thank you, Yasmin. Thank you. Thank you. Whatever you did, if it wasn't good enough, you needed to try and do better and keep at it. Actually, village life produces the philosophical ideas that are germane to democratic thought and practice. I mean, just losing four of your 
bandmates, soulmates is bad enough. But the worst thing is out of those four families, two of the families blamed me. But the progress from 1991 to 2017, I think only took India to a better place. It was really through the uh, th through the transition into politics that I uh, that I had the good luck of becoming a writer.